Amen. Thank you for being in Bible study tonight. Thank you for joining us uh, for the series on, on what we're calling Better. And um, the series Better is all about uh, the new covenant being better than the old covenant. And that's what the Lord has done for us since Calvary is obviously, um, according to Hebrews, uh, is a better covenant that we have in serving God today than any other day. I thank God for the opportunity we have to know him and to be part of the family of God. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? And so we're in the series. We're in lesson four. This is already a third of the way through the series, uh, and um, obviously all the other um, events that are happening at the same time, we do want to make just a few announcements to make sure everyone is aware. Tomorrow evening is the ladies' event here at the church, 7 o'clock. If you haven't signed up already and you plan on coming, it would be good if you signed up after service so they have an accurate count. That's tomorrow night at 7, and uh, you'll want to be part of that if you're a lady Friday night is men's conference starting here, along with Samuel Summit. So for any of the young boys from 6 to 15 are part of Samuel Summit, and then obviously anyone over 15 uh, is part of men's conference. And so um, there's going to be lots of events happening here at the church, after church, Saturday. Um, so please uh, take note, sign up for men's conference, Samuel Summit, if you have a uh, a young man in your family that fits into that age group, make sure they're at Men's Conference and Samuel Summit. This is a special event, so that's happening on Sat Friday and Saturday. And then All Nations Sunday is on Sunday morning. Every nation, amen, is going to be that we have attending our church will be represented and ones that are here on, on, on a regular basis. And uh, if you know of someone that's of a different culture, invite them to be part of Sunday morning service. We're excited about what the Lord is going to do in that service, and uh, we'll be speaking along the lines, obviously, of All Nations Sunday. Thank the Lord that every tribe, nation, and tongue is part of the family of God. Amen. What an exciting time, amen, to be part of the family of God. Amen. So that's on, on Sunday, and then the following uh, Sunday is our unity service, October the 30th, all of our Daughter Work Satellite Churches will be coming together. Brother McNair will be here speaking in that morning service. And then immediately following the service will be a special reception that we have for everyone that has come to Mission Point uh, in the last five years, since 2017 up to now. And we're going to celebrate. Uh, and there's a large group of people that are in that, uh, in that number. So if you've come to Mission Point, since 2017, we would like you to stay and be with us for that celebration and um, thank the Lord for uh, growth and what God is doing. Amen. Some people come because they married someone. Some people come because they moved. Some people come because church is new. Now, all kinds of reasons why people have come, and uh, we want to celebrate that together. Amen. So keep that in mind for some uh, things that are happening in the next couple of weeks. We're going into lesson four. And we've been focusing on the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus and Hebrews go together. We've been focusing and will continue to focus for the next, uh, for, for a total of six lessons. This is lesson four. First six lessons we'll be focusing on the book of Leviticus. And then we'll go into the book of Hebrews and do the connecting um, of what uh, is uh, brought forward in the book of Hebrews. And so we've been going through the book of Leviticus in certain uh, aspects um, uh, what um, God has provided for us and how relevant that is to us uh, today. And so I'm going to focus tonight on chapters 8 to 10, mostly from chapter 8, but um, the book of Leviticus is primarily uh, a law code and really a ritual manual, uh, but it does contain some historical narratives uh, in two different locations. It speaks of historic narratives, and one of the locations we're going to uh, talk about tonight, one of those narratives is the priestly ordination uh, ceremony and the events that surround uh, when uh, ministry uh, is dealing with sin or when sin happens to ministry. Uh, so there's uh, a lot that happens in this three chapters, 
and um, the historical portion of these three chapters emphasizes three, uh, three particular things. The first thing, God uses chosen people to communicate for him and act on his behalf. He's always done that, where he's always chosen people, not perfect people, no such thing. But he's always chose people to work on his behalf what he wants done. Could God do it himself? Yes, he could. God is able to do anything. But he uses people. He uses his creation. And so God uses people to communicate. That's why you have a pastor tonight. That's why uh, we minister the word of the Lord. He uses people to communicate on his behalf. Uh, second thing, God's chosen people uh, are still just people. They are still just people. And so because we're just people uh, and still human, uh, sometimes humanity falls and errors and mistakes are made. So just because someone uh, God uses to communicate does not mean the person is perfect or does not mis make mistakes. So um, we're still just human. And thirdly, the most, maybe the most uh, important uh, is any deviance from that plan uh, of what God has for service, uh, he, he takes note of, and uh, God wants things done a certain way. He wants done, things done his way. He wants things done according to the word. And any deviance from that, um, and God takes, he takes... Um, uh, he takes note of that and is not pleased with that. So um, God chooses people. People are not perfect. And yet God has always had a plan. And he wants who he chooses to share that plan. So it's important for us tonight to, as a pastor, not to minister what people desire or what people like or what people are happy with or not happy with. It's important to minister what the Word says and, and what God desires to have said. So, um, as a pastor, uh, we cannot be intimidated to uh, preach the Word. Can't be intimidated to preach the Word. Uh, no matter what the response is or what the response isn't, the Word still uh, does not return void. And so tonight, chapter 8, deals with this process. Of course, um, uh, as you see in uh, Leviticus 8, it deals with the process of ordaining priests uh, for ministry. Well, uh, if you read through the first four verses of chapter 8, it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and a bullock for the sin offering two rams and a basket of unleavened bread, and gather thou all the congregation together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and the assembly was gathered together unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The first thing that you notice in this process of people being called for ministry or being set aside for ministry the first thing that happens that God gave Moses to do is it was to happen before all of the people. All of the people. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God, and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Um, sometimes we get caught up in that certain things are only for uh, uh, ministers in a certain capacity. So um, whether someone is licensed or whether someone's not licensed, that's, the scripture doesn't talk about licensed ministers. <laughs> it talks about ministry. Every one of us in this room tonight are ministers. We may minister in a different capacity than someone else, but everyone in this room is ministers. And when, when uh, John is writing the book of Revelation, 
he clarifies that God hath made us kings and priests unto God. Not just certain people. So, first of all, we are, we are over our own life. No one else is responsible for my life besides me. I'm responsible for my life. I need to, first of all, give my heart to God and worship God, follow God, serve God, obey God. All, that's, that's, you can't do that for me. And then God puts people in my life. Uh, pastors, leadership in my life, which I still have, obviously, today, that guide and direct uh, for the betterment of my life spiritually. And so, first of all, I'm a priest of my own life. I'm a priest of my home. And then God has given me the pleasure, the privilege of being a minister of this congregation and beyond. And so, uh, they're, they're all processes. So, uh, everybody in this room is first of all responsible for your salvation, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And then if you have family, then you are also responsible for that. So when the Bible says you can gain the whole world and lose your own soul, that's not just speaking about you individually. That can also be speaking about your family. Okay, so uh, if, if everything I... Uh, uh, aim towards this only on my behalf, then it could be detrimental to the ones that I am overseeing in my own home. And so when, when uh, this starting uh, point that is mentioned here in verses 1 to 4 of Leviticus chapter 8, he's saying, listen, you are going to be uh, called into ministry before the whole congregation. So there is a responsibility that you and I have uh, as a child of God and being in whatever ministry capacity you are in. May not be behind the pulpit, maybe not be in a Sunday school class, maybe not in music. None of those things are, uh, are the only ministries. Every person in this room has gifts that God has given you. Whether it's working with people, whether it's uh, dealing with uh, book work, whether it's dealing with with uh, technology, whether we all have a responsibility to have integrity in what God has called us to do. There's, there's a, a before the congregation mentality that happens in ministry. Well, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to do it my own way. That's not how God's called us. We're part of a family of God. Everything that I do, everything that I say uh, can have an effect on other people that are part of the family of God. And so when Aaron and his sons are being ordained to be priests, they're having this happen, not in some private ceremony. You guys are going to have a, a, you know, you're going to be the top of the line here, special people. No, no, this is happening before the whole congregation. Everyone is part of this calling. It's a very, very important point. Verses 5 to 9 Aaron is being given directions. Moses is being told this, that Aaron and his sons are to be dressed in splendid garments. Splendid garments. You can read down. It says in verse 5, And Moses said unto the congregation, This is the thing which the Lord commanded to be done. Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He put them upon the coat and girded them with the girdle and clothed them with the robe and put the ephod upon them. And he girded him with the curious girdle of the ephod and bound it unto him therewith and he put the breastplate upon him also he put in the breastplate the urim and the thummim and he put the mitre upon his head also upon the mitre even upon his forehead did he put the golden plate the holy crown as the lord commanded moses now if you're just reading all that it seems like a lot of stuff that they had to put on um, but these are all what are considered the splendid garments of what they're going to use in ministry. Now, we could do a lesson actually on each part of those. I'll just focus on a couple things because there may be a couple things there that don't seem to be real clear on what it entails. So when you see in verse 8, the Urim and the Thummim, those are objects, perhaps uh, even stones, uh, that are used to receive answers from the Lord. Some scholars believe that the matters of judgment, Urim 
meant being cursed and the Thummim denounced innocence. There's different thought patterns through different scholars. Um, they, they actually mean light and perfection. So gems or stones that carried, are carried high on the priest were used by him to determine God's will in certain matters. And, and some scholars believe that they were, they were cast even uh, forth or thrown forth and the priest would get to see uh, important decisions on whether it was yes or no. Uh, and uh, uh, you see this, that they're attached to the priest's uh, breastplate for the reason that's why the breastplate is sometimes called the breastplate of judgment. Uh, and so you have um, somewhere uh, a square uh, pouch or, or, or such that these two objects or stones were in that represented the will of God in some capacity. Lots of discussion Lots of people talk about it. Not everyone knows exactly or clarity of exactly everything about it. But um, if you look at a Jewish historian called Josephus, he was a contemporary of the Apostle John. He believed that the Urim and the Thummim had to do with the flashing of the precious stones and the breastplate and that they would be giving answers of the will of God, yes or no. Exactly how it is, we don't know. We just know that all these things made up these splendid garments. I want you to notice in this passage of the splendid garments in verse 6, the Bible says that they were washed with water. Moses caused them to bathe entirely. You can compare that to Leviticus 16 and 4 where they were just to merely wash their hands and feet if they were to go through the daily ministrations. But this, this is something different. They were to be totally cleansed, and the high priest had to go through uh, uh, this, uh, this cleansing, this, this process that they were entirely bathed and not just their hands and feet. That's why you see it when Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 7 and 1, he said, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Uh, he's going back to understanding that this is not just a, a little process. This is not just merely, well, I'm going to clean my hands, my feet, wash my face. No, he, Paul's comparing it to cleansing ourselves from anything that would be contrary to what God would have. And so when you're looking at verses 5 to 9 of Le Leviticus 8, and you're talking about these splendid garments... There was no sense of them appearing a certain way unless they were clean. Well, the Lord gets into this discussion with the leaders in the New Testament. And they're debating with him and he says, listen, you're like white at sepulchers. You look good on the outside, but you're filthy on the inside. So the clarity is, listen, if we're going to be anointed for what the Lord has for us, it's not just enough to appear the part. No, it's not. It can't be that I'm just saying the part. It's got to be like Paul saying, cleanse me from all unrighteousness and filthiness of the flesh. You know what he's saying is, I want to look right, but I want my spirit to be right as well. I want to talk right, but I want my attitude to be right. I want to portray how I should be as a Christian, but I want to treat others the same way, whether I'm in business or in church. All filthiness of the flesh and spirit. This, this idea of anointing and what is spe being spoken of in Leviticus chapter 8, it wasn't enough for just Aaron and his sons to do some half-hearted, half-accomplished way of being a priest of their own life, their family, and of the people. No, Moses said, listen, I want this to be that you are completely, completely bathed, undefiled, separate. Well, the Lord hasn't changed. 
He hasn't changed. He still wants us to be undefiled, separate. He still wants you and I to stick out. Some people get upset about sticking out. You're supposed to stick out. Don't be upset about sticking out, whether you know whether you, uh, you stick out or not. You're actually supposed to. Jude chapter 1 verse 22, it says, Of some have compassion, making a difference, and others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. I don't want anything in our lives that would have any spots of this world or even of myself. I want that to be cleansed, purified. It says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Not something that you or I can do in ourselves, but it's the only wise God and our Savior. To him be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God, take our lives and let there be a cleansing of everything to do with us so that we're anointed before you. Whether you're in the pulpit or whether you're in line behind someone at the grocery store. The same anointing can be there. Exact same anointing. Whether you're seeing someone on the street or whether you're sitting at the keyboard, the same anointing can happen. God cleanse us. Let our garments be splendid. Not for my glory, not for anything that people would see in me, but that they would see you in me. The anointing. This is what makes the difference. This is, this is what separated Aaron and his sons. Listen, we're going to separate you. We're going to put you aside. There's going to be a special anointing, but there is a process. It's going to be before the congregation, and you need to be cleansed before putting on these garments. Verse 10 starts the third part of this process. And Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was therein, sanctified them. And he sprinkled thereof upon the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all his vessels, both the, the labor and his foot, to sanctify them. And he poured of the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointed him to sanctify him. And Moses brought Aaron's sons and put coats upon them and girded them with girdles and put bonnets upon their, on them as the Lord commanded Moses. Uh, this, this wonderful process of, of, okay, it's going to happen before the congregation. And, and then Moses uh, Aaron said to Aaron and his sons, I want you to be cleansed and I want you to represent these garments uh, of anointing in a particular way. But notice now, he says here, it's, it's really... The consecration of that anointing oil that's a put upon you, upon the equipment, upon every, every part of what we do. It's like the worship center of our lives. Do you know that your anointing can work without you ever saying anything? You can just walk in the room. And because you're full of God, things change. People don't even know every t all the time what has just happened. We may not even always notice what happens. But when you're full of God and you're anointed of God as a minister, everyone in this room, you can walk into situations. And you can allow God to work through your life. The anointing on our lives is what makes the difference. It's not how long we've been in church. Mm -mm. Not, not, not how much talents we have. That doesn't make the difference. It's not about how much charisma we have. That doesn't make the difference. None of those, all those things can all be good in their own way. But let me tell you what makes the difference is the anointing that is on a person's life. 
that you walk into a situation and you just, you can pray over that situation. You can speak into that situation. You can allow God to use you in that situation. Can give you multiple examples that happened this week. Not because of anything special within myself. I can give you an example from Sunday night. I can give you an example from Monday. And I can give you an example from yesterday. A particular people God put in my life that I didn't even know was going to happen. But in that moment. Had someone asked me today. I'm just going to pick up my car. I've got appointments. I'm just going and the person said, you're a pastor? Yes. I need to ask you a question. Sure. What is it about religion? How do I know which one's right? I said, well, let's start with Religion is boring. That caught her attention. A pastor saying that religion is boring. Because religion is boring. It's got, don't matter what religion it is, you've got all kinds of traditions. But I said, what makes the difference is when you have a relationship with God. That's what changes everything. Just had a five minute little but you know what it's not about me coming in and pounding the bible down on the desk and say you're going to listen to me no it's about walking into a situation already anointed and when you walk into that situation god allows opportunity to happen everybody in this room has the same same opportunity no one different we're all filled with the same spirit We're all, we all receive the same spirit. And so that anointing, that anointing that separates you aside, the cleansing that happens, opens up the opportunity for the worship center. See, this is what Isaiah 10 and 27 says. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. People's lives are changed, not because of you or I. The lives are changed because of the anointing that's upon your life as a child of God. I thank God for the power of the anointing. John writes it this way, 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which ye have received of him, abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. We just, when we get it all straightened it out that this anointing is from him and not from us, then there's absolutely nothing for you or I to be ashamed of because it's his anointing that abides in you that destroys the yoke of people that are held hostage or captive. Happened on Sunday, just talking to a young lady, my wife and I, and um, she wanted to know where we pastored. She couldn't believe that anyone could come to church, that anyone would be allowed to come to church. And within just a few moments of talking to her and inviting her, I believe without a doubt that I will see her in church. 
Again, it's not about you or I. It's the anointing of God's spirit that works through your life because you and I are ministers of his. Thank God for that opportunity. And when we, when we, when we know that he's righteous, we know that he's going to get the glory. It's, it's going to be that people are born of him, not of us. So that's verses 10 to 13. This is this process of being set aside as priests. Okay, this was, this was absolutely crucial for the children of Israel to have someone that was set aside as a representative that the whole congregation got to see, that their lives were cleansed, and that they were anointed. Well, it's in, in 2022, this is what the world needs. The world needs to see a whole congregation that's already cleansed and anointed working for God. Amen. Verses 14 to 29. I won't read all of those verses. But this is the solemn sacrifices that were offered uh, as part of this process. You can read down through those verses. Um, This is where the sin offering is offered, the burn offering. Um, And uh, you can can see where um, uh, there's uh, the consecration that takes place there. And uh, uh, all the, the different offerings that are taking place. And we've spoken about the different offerings. But... Uh, The idea behind this is sacrifice. And um, when you think of sacrifice and the blessing for sacrifice, the blessing is uh, is to be able to do it again. So if you've done something sacrificially for the Lord, the blessing for that is to have the opportunity to do that again. What a wonderful thing that happens when when you give of yourself sacrificially to the Lord in some capacity for the expansion of his kingdom, and you watch someone that you've reached out to, you've witnessed to, you've invited, whatever the case is, and you watch their life being changed, it kind of, it kind of builds something in your life again. I want to do that again. God, I want you to put another person in my life. If you've been a blessing to some, to some person in some way, and, 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 and it's been such a blessing to them, you it, it, it rises in you. I, I want to do that again. That's the opportunity. The blessing for sacrifice is the opportunity to do it again. So very quickly, I'll just share with you four types of sacrifice, not in the sense of offerings of, of Leviticus, but what happens through to us through sacrifice according to the New Testament. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 15, again, connecting these two books. This is what the writer of Hebrews says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice to, to uh, praise to God continually, that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Um, so the first type of sacrifice is with our lips. What you say. You can sacrifice uh, for the Lord with what you say. That can be uh, with worship on a daily basis that you give the sacrifices of praise to the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise unto the Lord. That that should be part of our anointed day every day. I understand we have days when it's more difficult to, uh, to, to give a positive sacrifice of praise. But it should be the desire of our heart on a continual basis. I'm going to offer up a sacrifice of praise to the Lord today in some capacity with my voice. I could, I suppose I could have said to the lady today, don't have time to answer your question. But that would not have been a very good sacrifice of praise. Of the lips. Um, But rather, no, let's let's stop and there's a question being asked. There's someone that's got a hunger. There's something happening in someone's life right now. Something that someone desires to hear. Someone desires to know. Sacrifice. It could be as simple as 
uh, as you coming into a, a negative situation and speaking faith. It could be as simple as you uh, giving an encouraging word to someone who needs encouragement today. Let it be the sacrifice of your lips, not just to uh, uh, you as an individual, but obviously to the people around you and to your Lord and Savior. Well, you know, I don't feel like it. You praise him anyway. He deserves our praise. Well, I'm tired. Um, well, uh, that, it, there's, there's something about the sacrifice of praise of lips, even when we're tired. It actually uh, it generates an enthusiasm within us and a refreshment in our spirit. You can come to the house of the Lord and have had a long day, but you start to worship and praise him, and something happens in your spirit where you feel refreshed. The sacrifice of your lips. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Oh, what a shout. God, help me on a continual basis. If you have allowed me before the congregation to be a minister... And God, I've been cleansed, cleansed from the filthiness of flesh and spirit and anointed by you. Let the words that come from my mouth uh, uh, out of my heart, let it be a sacrifice of praise uh, and adoration and thanksgiving. Sacrifice of our lips. Number two, sacrifice of our life. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, sacrifice of our life, where we say, God, whatever you need to do through my life today, doesn't matter whether it interrupts my day, doesn't matter whether it's convenient or not. I make myself available to you today that whatever you desire to do, you just never know. I went apple picking Monday. My wife wanted to go apple picking. We checked about five or six places, and they were all closed. So I drove all the way to Keswick Ridge to get apples. I don't even know what it cost me per pound. But it didn't matter. I know what it cost me per pound to buy the apples. <laughs> but I didn't add up what it cost to get there. didn't matter. I went apple picking. There were some people there made connections with from Somalia. Had a great chat with them. And then there was an elder man that was there helping look after the apple picking. I spoke some sunshine into his day. He was telling me about the people complaining about his weighing or scale ability of weighing the apples, how they were complaining about it on Facebook. I said, well, sir, you're not going to have to worry about me doing that. No fears of that. I'm going to speak. And it, it, was, it was kind of, I never met him before. Don't know him. He's 76 years old. All I know is I'm going to, I'm going to shine forth as a living sacrifice today. I don't know if I'll ever see him again. Don't know. Doesn't matter. I'm going to leave an impression that day that what God has done in my life It was more than just apple picking. That was fun too. And boy, they're juicy. He said, if you walk all the way to the bottom of the row, you'll get the good ones. Everyone picks up at the top of the row. It was a long walk to the bottom of the row. It was a lot longer walk back, it seemed like. But oh, they were, they were nice and juicy. And the apples are good, but it was the conversation 
that I left there encouraged in my spirit. Because that's what matters is leaving something imparted. Because God has called you into ministry. He's cleansed you, anointed you. Now speak into people's lives and also be a living sacrifice. That's the, that's the idea of what we go about in our week. I don't know. I have no idea. When, when I woke up Monday morning, I didn't know I was going to end up in Keswick Ridge talking to someone that was there looking after the apple picking. Didn't know. But it didn't matter. It's whatever you find yourself in. Let your life be a living sacrifice because that's what Paul says is holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That means that's our duty. It's our duty. Thirdly, the sacrifice of our finance. You see that in verse 16 of Hebrews 13. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. In every aspect of our life. Yes, it may cost us something. But it's, it's God that is to get the glory. And fourthly, sacrifice of our love, which is also found in this verse 16 of Hebrews 13. Forget not to do good and to share with others. That's what the NIV says. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. It's not about what is pleasing me. It's about what pleases him. And it's not about what I can do for me. It's about what I can do for someone else. This is the sacrifice of the anointing God's put upon our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Because something powerful has happened to you and I, and everybody else needs to hear about it. Everybody needs to hear about it. Okay, the last section, in verses 32 and verse 36, Moses took of the anointing oil and of the blood which was upon the altar and sprinkled it upon Aaron, upon his garments, upon his sons, and upon his son's garments with him, sanctified Aaron and his garments and his sons and his son's garments with him. And Moses said unto Aaron and to his sons, boil the flesh at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation there, eat it with the bread that is in, in the basket of consecrations, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it, and that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread shall ye burn with fire, and ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your uh, consecration be at an end. For seven days shall, be, shall he consecrate you. So what happens in this last portion so just think of the process, the whole congregation. It's done before the whole congregation. We're responsible to the whole congregation. God, whatever you're doing in my life, I want it to be a blessing to every person. Everyone needs to think that way. And then the idea is God cleanse me from all filthiness and, and of the flesh and spirit so that I represent what I am wearing of you. What, help me, God, to be everything that you want me to be. Let me be anointed, God so that I sacrifice with my lips, my life, my finance, and love. Let that be who I am. And then he says in this last section that they were to be dedicated with anointing oil and blood, and they are required to stay in the tabernacle court for seven days. The idea behind that, obviously, was that seven days was a week. Well, there's a type of that for us, that um, it, is, it is every day. Not one day a week or once a week, but the whole week. God, what is it that you want to do through my life today? What is it that you want to do through my life on Saturday? God, how is it that you want me to represent you on Sunday? Not once a week, but every day of the week. Let my life be God anointed before you to be a representation of you. The idea behind what they were doing here is the, 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 the week, the seven days, was a completeness, a perfection of what God was doing in their anointing and their ordination, their consecration to the Lord. It's not when it's convenient for me. It's when, uh, when I set myself aside for him, I'm being committed to him every day. 
every day. I, th- I believe, I believe that if we ask the Lord to put people in our path on a daily basis, that's exactly what he will do. Now, it might be sometimes that we don't always recognize or notice, and obviously we all go through times like that. But I think, God, open my eyes. Help me to view, see what you're trying to do through my life. And I believe God will put opportunities in our lives on a daily basis to be consecrated, dedicated unto him, and to let that anointing flow. Matter, no matter if it's at the hospital, at the grocery store, doesn't matter where it is. It can be as simple as, as, as God speaking into your life to, to be an encouragement to someone. This is what um, you see here in verse 30. Moses took the anointing oil and the blood which was upon the altar, sprinkled it upon Aaron, upon his garments, upon his sons, upon his son's garments, sanctified Aaron and his garments and, the sons, uh, and his son's garments with him. We find that the high priest himself was even sprinkled with the blood of the sacrifice. Aaron himself. Then you step forward to New Testament. God didn't ask Aaron to do something that he didn't do to himself. Notice what happens when you look at at, at Jesus Christ and his blood. He sweat as it were great drops of blood in the garden. I don't even know what type of agony that is. Can't even imagine what type of agony that is. In the crown that was put upon his head, blood rolled down his forehead, face. In the piercing of his hands and his feet, blood was being shed. Stripes that were put on his back. In his side that was pierced came out blood and water. This wasn't just, this just wasn't uh, the high priest of the Old Testament that had blood applied. The, The blood, even of Jesus Christ, was applied to himself. He said, this is what, this is what's going to change your life, is the shedding of my blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All of these acts were acts of an atonement that was performed by the high priest. What Aaron was in the Old Testament, we thank God for. But he does not compare to the high priest that you and I have. Hallelujah. Where Jesus Christ shed his own blood. Not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood he shed for you and I. And that blood was applied, uh, rolled down his, his hands, his head, uh, his side. Amen. That's the blood. Amen. That when it's applied, uh, the symbol, the, uh, the idea of faith uh, in the blood of Jesus, it cleanses you and I from all sin because uh, of what Jesus did for you and I at Calvary. So this ceremony, this ordination service uh, that was designed to impress uh, the people of the book of Leviticus and on Aaron's sons, this supreme significance of their role in the worship of Israel. And, and, and you see, and you can read through chapters, the, the chapters 9 and 10 and see all the processes have happened even when things didn't go right. You can read about Nadab and Abihu. They didn't do it right. They paid the price for it. But this is the process that you and I can experience tonight as a child of God. Not just what was significant for the priest in Leviticus 8. But what is significant to you or I tonight as a child of God. That when your life is given to the Lord... You're consecrated and dedicated and set aside before God. Something powerful has happened in your life. It's not just left for a certain few. I 
And it's not just for certain needs. I was at a, a funeral not too long ago. And I met someone. Good person. Nice person. Known, I've known him for a while. And um, he was sharing with me about a house that he had built. I didn't even know that he had built it. And it was, he was having great trouble selling it. It's been months and months. And it's, it's been a pretty good market for selling houses over the last while. And he was struggling with not being able to sell it. And I said to him that day, so I'm going to pray that God sells your house. And I'm going to pray that a great family moves in. You say, well, why would you pray that? Well, it's right across the street from my house. <laughs> I want a great family to move in. And a wonderful family from Nigeria bought the house and have moved in across the street from me. And it just happened within days. He sent me an email last night thanking me for praying. It wasn't it not me. Just just the anointing that God's even concerned about someone's house. He's so concerned about us that if we just let the spirit flow, it can be for someone's salvation. It can be for someone's healing. It can be for someone's job situation. It can be for someone's house. Just let God. This is the process that happens. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that everybody within this room has the opportunity to be a minister for you. Everyone in this room, God, has the opportunity to be cleansed from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Hallelujah. God, everybody in this room, God, has the opportunity to be anointed with the power of the Holy Ghost where we sacrifice uh, with what we say. We sacrifice, God, with, with our life. We sacrifice with our finance. We sacrifice by expressing your love. Uh, hallelujah. God, we just allow that to happen through our lives on a daily basis, not just once in a while, not just once a week, or, Lord, or when it's convenient. No, no, we can allow that to happen every day. I thank you, Jesus, that we have the privilege of serving you and the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon our lives, God. Hallelujah. This ordination, consecration, Lord, set aside a part unto you, God, is a powerful demonstration of what you can do in a person's life. I thank you, Jesus, that it's not just for a few. It's for everybody that is here tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know how I know that's true? It's not just for people who call themselves ministers by occupation or vocation. Because I wanted God to do that through my life long before I became a pastor. I wanted God to do that through my life before I ever became clergy. Everybody in this room has the opportunity to be anointed of God, used of God. Thank you, Jesus, for that opportunity. Amen. I encourage you. I encourage you over the next few days, God, give me an opportunity today to show forth your wonderful spirit in some way. Let me, Lord, let me feel upon my spirit to speak into someone's life, put someone in my path. Whatever the case is, God, let me be a channel for your glory, Lord, each day. Would you stand tonight? Thank you for being part of Bible study and better. I thank the Lord for the covenant that he's placed within our lives. Amen. The new covenant. The new covenant. That powerful anointing of God's spirit. God, let your blessing be upon each one tonight as we go our separate ways. God, I pray that I would hear testimony. 
God, of your miraculous power that works in people's lives over the next few days just to shine forth your glory. Lord, let me hear of what you can do and what you are doing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and thank you for being in Bible study tonight.